Hey guys, welcome to my channel. I am the Scared Sheep, and in this episode, I'd like to talk to you about the Japanese mockumentary Hoso Kinshi. Hoso Kinshi translates to banned broadcast and was a TV program that aired on Fuji Television from 2003 to 2008, but only consisted of six episodes and three movies. Two of the movies continue the storylines of the second and sixth episodes. There actually was a seventh episode, but for whatever reason, this didn't air until 2017, nearly 10 years after the last episode aired. Although each episode's story is different, Hoso Kinshi's running theme behind each one is gathering facts doesn't always lead to the truth. And at the end of each show, they ask, Were you able to see the truth? All of this is to say, the real storyline of each episode isn't always so obvious. One of the reasons that I enjoy this series so much is that the clues are hidden, some more so than others, but it's up to the audience to figure out what really happened. The one thing about this series, though, is the way that it's presented. It's done in a very typical way for Japanese TV that, aside from its subject, Is pretty much exactly what you'd see in a real news presentation. So, in episodes one to four, they put a small disclaimer at the end of each episode saying that it was all a work of fiction. Now, if you stayed until the end and saw that disclaimer, then no problem, right? But it seems that more than a few people either didn't notice or changed the channel halfway through the show, thinking that what they were watching was real. And they complained. After that, episodes 5 and 6 feature the disclaimer at the beginning of the episode as well as at the end. Hoso Kinshi isn't really a horror per se. There are no jump scares or ghosts, but rather each episode gives you a slice of life scenario with an element of the supernatural or sci fi that could be believable. And with that, let's jump into episode one. Episode one, which aired at midnight on April 1st, 2003, opens to a walkthrough of the supposed archives where these tapes are kept. The narrator explains that there are countless videotapes stored in TV stations. Referred to as materials, these are complete, pre edited tapes that have been recorded on location or in the studio. Materials are usually erased after broadcasting, and only select news and popular programming are kept. However, there is another type of material called okudaidi that is also stored here. Okudaidi means to put something on hold or to shelve it. So, these are tapes that could not be broadcasted at the time for some reason. The narrator continues to explain that while some of the details about these tapes have been lost due to changes in staff and related parties at the time, this program has received permission to re edit and broadcast those materials now. We start our story in Odaiba, a man made island in Tokyo Bay connected by the famous Rainbow Bridge that we see in the background. Our reporter Saiki Madoka talks about how Tokyo, being one of the world's largest cities, has changed and grown with the people through many large events such as World War II, earthquakes, and the economic boom. She then flubs her line and apologizes, going back to try that take again. She continues that after the economy collapsed, it would seem that the growth of Tokyo has stopped, and now we see many empty buildings around the city. She introduces the young man she is about to interview, who says he snuck into one of these abandoned buildings with his friends, and they have all since gone missing. From here, the reporter, director, and cameraman visit Ohashi Naoya, a second year student at a nearby university in his apartment in Saitama, a prefecture bordering Tokyo to the north. <laughs>
そう<笑>いやマジでマジで<笑>イコスちょっと怖くねえちょっと行こう行こう行こう早く,早く俺後ろから行くから行くからただいま12時51分です今から行ってみたいと思います<笑>その時は何もなかったんですけどビル出た後に良一がいないことに気がついたんですよねでも良一先に帰ってると思ったんで、まあ、僕らも気にせずその時は帰ったんですでもその日良一帰ってないみたいでその後連絡つかなくなったんですよねそれからその時一緒に入った佐藤真奈美っていう女の子、まあ、僕ちょっと好きだったんでその時電話番号交換したんですよ僕何回か電話かけたんですけど全然出てくれなくて嫌われちゃったのかなと思ってたんですけどそしたらその後失踪したなんて聞いたんでそんな2人のことがあったんでもう1人一緒に入った前田理香子さんとメールで連絡を取ってたんですけど。何日か前から連絡が来なくなったんですよね共通の友達前田さんの共通の友達に電話してその子も前田さんと連絡が取れないみたいででもまあそんなことはないと思うんですけどもしかしたら次僕に何かあるんじゃないかなと思ってやっぱそう考えると。すごい怖いんですよね。The show moves to an interview with Professor Machizawa, who gives us an interesting take on the matter. He explains that mass hysteria is the easiest explanation for the haunting reports. That intense caution translates into fear, and people start sincerely believing that they saw or heard something. They are so convinced that it is as if being under hypnosis, and they won't go back to their old selves. Two days after visiting Ohashi-san in his apartment, the reporter and crew go to check out the building he spoke of in his interview. There, they interview the man in charge of the building management named Zaizen. このビルの管理自体は私たちの会社が任されてるんですけどね細かいことは聞かされてませんもうどのぐらい使われてないんですかうん34年でしょうねこのビルの中に入って失踪した人間が3人いるんですけれども、うん、そのことに関して何かしてることありますかうんだからねさっきから何度も言うように本当に困ってるおかげでこのビルだって売れないし本当に迷惑してるんですやめてくださいさっきも言ったでしょう Through staff at the management company the crew was able to negotiate with the owner of the building to enter the site The owner agreed Hoping that this report might help get rid of the rumors about the building. As she explores the building, reporter Saeki talks about how the place is constantly dark without electricity and smells strongly of mold. She mentions the urban legend and rumors now circulating about it that once you enter, you cannot escape. She then wonders aloud about whether Ohashi's story may give some truth to these rumors. On April 16th, the crew interviewed Maeda Rikako's family. Rikako was the third student to go missing. She lived at home with her parents in Saitama. They asked if anything was different on the day she disappeared, and with their permission, the staff went into Rikako's room to record. There, the mom showed the crew her daughter's school notebook, which had the letter Z scribbled on it in red marker again and again. The program makes the connection. 
that this is the same Z graffiti that they recorded on the wall of the abandoned building. After the interview with the parents, the crew decides to contact Ohashi-san again to update him on their new findings. However, he wasn't picking up his phone and he did not respond to any of their emails. So they decided to visit the apartment themselves, only to find no one there. They waited outside his apartment until late at night, but he never came home. Ohashi's family has also been unable to get in touch with him, and no one seems to have any idea where he's gone. Standing across from the building, a reporter speaks about how all four students are now officially missing. They all disappeared in different places and at different times. The three crew members are convinced that the reason the four of them are missing has something to do with the building, and continue their investigation. The staff contacted the owner of the building that they referred to as Mr. N. Mr. N refused to be interviewed on camera, but agreed to a phone interview as long as he remained anonymous. He pretty much just restates Zizen's earlier sentiment that the four missing students and the rumors surrounding the building were really inconvenient for him, since he can't find an interest buyer for the building. Mr. N mentions that among the companies that used to be in the building was a small publishing company that just up and disappeared one day. It was on the third floor of the building and run by a man named Toto Shinji. The crew was able to find that Toto-san had moved himself and his base of operations from Tokyo to a mountain lodge in Inomachi, Fukushima. With the pen name Otsuko Tsushinji, Toto is a self-proclaimed psychic who was featured in magazines for a while, not because of anything positive, but because Toto's predictions were always, always wrong. But what actually caught the eye of the crew was his pen name. ま、私たちは The staff sits down for the interview with Toto-san, which begins quite normally. They ask him if he knows anything about the four missing students, and he says that he has no reason to know anything. They then ask about why his company left the building so abruptly, and he says that he simply lost interest in it and became more interested in other things. That's when things got weird. So no. ほかに見つかったやりたいことというのはどんなことなんでしょうか。目覚めたんですよ。何に目覚めたんですか。あなたに説明してもわからないでしょう。その力を知りたい。え。嘘をつけ。お前たちは私の力なんて信じてないだろう。申し訳ない。私は私は彼らから力を授かったんだ。あのビルで何があったんですか？彼らっていうのは誰なんでしょう？ 
消えたんだと思う導かれたんだよ導かれたって何なんですか私の授かった力だ気になればあなたたちの頭を割ることだってできるんですよ試してみようか The four students, our reporter, Saiki Madoka, director Tsuda Toru, and cameraman Endo Masayuki have all disappeared. The only thing left at Toto's residence was the staff van, recording equipment, and a few videotapes. In 2003, other staff members from the TV station visited the Mountain Lodge to search for any clues related to the missing staff. The Mountain Lodge was now for sale, and not surprisingly, since it is three years later, there were no traces of anyone there. The abandoned building that was the cause of all of this still stands with no buyer. The building owner, Mr. N, has also been reported missing. There have been multiple plans to demolish the building, but due to the costs, the building still stands. So, what do you think really happened to the four missing students? At first glance, it would seem as if it's a story where a bunch of people go missing and a crazy man with very specific psychic powers is featured at the end. But you get a pretty different story once you put the right clues together. The truth of this episode is that the psychic Toto was working together with the building manager Zaizen in running some sort of cult. Some Japanese analysis sites have also suggested that Zaizen is actually the one that originally recruited Toto and brainwashed him into believing he has psychic abilities in the first place. Regardless, we know that these two are essentially our ringleaders. You see, in English, this is clearly a Z, right? And the Z stands for Zaizen. But this mark is also very similar to a Japanese kanji that you have been shown a few times throughout the episode. This kanji, which looks pretty close to a Z, is Otsu, which stands for Otsukotsu, the pen name of Toto-san. The two of them have been trying to grow their cult and were able to brainwash and recruit Ohashi-san. The brainwash theory is essentially explained in the Professor Machizawa segment when he talks about those who have been brainwashed cannot return to their old selves. The two older men at some point asked Ohashi-san to try and bring in new members and so he organized a group date and brought them all to the abandoned building managed by Zaizen. 
We know that the building had already been set up for the four students' arrival as the door, which is always usually locked, is unlocked when they try to go in. This also probably means that Zaizen, and maybe even Toto, were already waiting inside. But something that night goes wrong, and Ohashi's high school friend Ryuichi is killed. We see evidence of poor Ryuichi's fate in the interview prior to the film crew going inside the building. Not only is Zaizen wearing Ryuichi's watch, but as the camera pans down, we catch a glimpse of a blood trail that they had tried to wash away. Since the two girls didn't disappear until February and then March, it seems that the three men still kept trying their brainwashing even after that night until it also failed. This would help to explain why Maeda Rikako, who vanished in March, scrolled the Z in her notebook again and again. Throughout the episode, we also get to play a fun little game, which I like to call Spot the Zaizen. The little Wally wannabe pops up several times throughout the episode as he has been following the film crew since they interviewed him. First, we see him at the base of Ohashi-san's apartment in a few different shots. Next, we see him behind the reporter hiding in the shadows of the building across the street. We even see him all the way in Fukushima next to the mountain lodge. All in all, he pops up a total of four times. How many did you spot? Thanks for playing Spot the Zaizen! <laughs> Toto and Zaizen would have us believe that up until now, Ohashi-san has not been heard from since the interview. But if you pay close attention, we actually see him once more. After the camera is put on its side on the floor, we see him in a pair of light wash jeans come rushing in to help keep the situation in the mountain lodge under control. We don't know for sure what exactly happened to the director and cameraman, but since we do see that the reporter has been brainwashed and looks like she is being kept in a closet, it's safe to assume that they either ended up like her or were killed like the students a few months earlier. We can also assume that given the fact that Zaizen still appears to be working as the building management means that they are still operating their cult in it at night. I do want to briefly mention that there were a couple segments included in this episode all about UFOs, but they are completely unrelated to the storyline, and since I didn't want this video to be an hour long, I chose to cut them out. As an extra little something something, in case anyone recognized the entryway and stairwell in the Maeda family home, that would be because it's actually the exact set where they filmed The Grudge. When I first watched this episode, noticing this kind of broke my suspension of disbelief for a bit, but now I find this to be a cool little factoid that I enjoy each time I watch. Hopefully this tidbit adds to your enjoyment of the episode like it did mine. And that is Hoso Kinshi episode 1. I really hope you enjoyed it and tune in next time for more Japanese horror with me. Let me know in the comments below what you liked or if you have any other theories about what happened in this episode. A huge thank you as well to everyone who helped me make this video possible. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you in the next episode. Bye.